we've started at the seabed. We've gone through the big IP uh, interconnects uh, to look at how those big fiber networks and uh, intercontinental networks are connecting and carrying the content between the locations. We've, uh, we've had a look at sustainability issues and caused some stir in the chat room, which is good. Um, and, uh, and we've had a look at the hardware that's filling the data centers and the edge locations uh, all over the world to enable the content delivery cycles. Now, with any luck, the illustrious Mark should be back uh, online. Mark, are you there? Absolutely down. Excellent. So now what we're going to do is we're going to dive up the stack one more step into the access networks uh, and look at what we're doing between the exchanges and the consumers. Take it away, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Dom. Uh, yeah, I have three great guests. Uh, three great guests. Um, I have uh, Steve Miller-Jones, Brandon Og, and uh, Thierry Fachet from Monarch. Um, let me give you a short introduction, all of you. Uh, Brenton, can I start with you first? If you have unmuted yourself. Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> uh, how many times can that happen? Um, yeah, thanks very much for, for having me. Um, I'm Brenton Al from Touchstream. Um, we uh, have a virtual knock, which is for you know, basically taking the knock out of the knock, monitoring uh, your entire workflow um, wherever you are. Uh, and we do that by uh, some of our own monitoring, which is primarily CDN monitoring, uh, and then integrating data from many other data sources. Uh, so you get an overall visualization of the whole workflow, which allows you to do simple root cause uh, um, analysis. Perfect. Steve. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. I'm Steve Miller-Jones. Um, I work for Netskirt Systems. Uh, we are focused on enabling content delivery uh, in the outskirts of the internet, uh, where there is either inconsistent access to network connectivity or um, the connectivity that the potential audience is using is, is somewhat limited or very limited. And yet there's still an audience there who is trying to or is, has a potential to consume content, but their ability to do that is somewhat limited. Um, so we operate a cloud-based distribution service and a network of remote edge caches in deployment locations for delivering content in those isolated environments. Um, some examples of the use cases are in public transport, such as rail, um, where we work in the, in the UK, for example, air transport uh, and remote communities. Those are the, the three key use cases that we're focused on. Um, our customers are the operators of the environments that we deploy into, and we work in partnership with connectivity providers, CDNs, and content owners. Perfect, thanks. Thierry, are you there as well? Yes, um, <clears throat> hello everybody. So I'm Thierry Fautier, Vice President of Strategy at Harmonic, um, leader, as you probably know by now, in video delivery. And we have, just for the record, the number one position in live OTT SaaS with more than 10 million subscriber managed by Harmonic with our VWS platform. So topic of interest, many, uh, but the one relevant with our today's discussion is how to scale OTT video delivery. And you will probably tell me, oh yes, we know how to do that. You need to better compress. Not only, we also need to work hard or harder on the streaming side with uh, how to optimize the network end to end from client back to the CDN cache, back to the origin, back to the encoder but also not, not last, but not the least, how to improve the CDN, which will be the topic of today's panel. Yes, and this is one of my favorite panels, uh, on my side at least. Um, Steve, I'll start with you. Um, you oh. recently made a switch from uh, Limelight to Netscript, mm -hmm. uh, an instant delivery, um, typically because main CDN do not cover all the use cases for kind of delivery, right? Especially in hard to reach places, moving places, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look like five years ahead of now, because everybody knows we're moving into the more distributed, more edge related area. Um, if you look five years ahead, what are we looking at in terms of its delivery? Yeah, I mean, where I might start with this is, is sort of thinking about what, what the kind of design challenge is, right? Yeah, sort of, if you think about the kind of question that's being asked is, how how might we ensure that content can be delivered to my consumer if I'm a content owner or my subscriber if I'm a network wherever they are? Um, how do I effectively amplify the availability of network connectivity so that 
media content doesn't overwhelm those networks, right? We can we can see the you know, continuing consumption of content. We can see, um, you know, in the UK as one example, um, you know, the convergence of uh, uh, dig digital broadcasting and IP distribution. Everything is going to become IP over time. So, you know, how how do we continue to enable the consumption of media without overwhelming things? Um, and then from a customer or a consumer, really, my expectation is that I have access to content anywhere. It's surely ubiquitous, right? My connectivity is part of my inflation bucket <laughs> that the government look at. Well, you know, why is content not available to me everywhere? Um, I carry the subscriptions in my pocket. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of titles, particularly when I'm not in my home. I don't have my, you know, huge HD, UHD TV, but I've got a screen in my pocket, which is perfectly reasonable. And I've got thousands and thousands of content available at my fingertip. Um, and if you think about it as a consumer, as I walk around, my concept really is, unless I stop to think about it quite hard, surely there's limitless bandwidth. I should just be able to do what I want to do. So I, I think what the challenge is, is sort of either, you know, either we debase the consumer of this idea that they can do what they want, which is probably not where, where anyone's going to go, or we think about how do we make it possible to deliver on those promises that there is ubiquitous access how do we manage that network environment how do we amplify it how do we best enable you know, the small percentage of those 1500 whatever the number is of videos in my pocket how do we enable the the most popular to really actually work when needed um how do we work out what they what they are um and so if we listen to like what the um gentleman from disney we're talking about this morning you know the distribution mesh um, use of open caching, range of CDNs, their own edge, you know, th those are sort of key things that have been happening for a while in the industry to, um, for content owners to deploy their own strategy around how do I deal with these different scenarios where, you know, the CDNs are built for um, highly popular, populous and dense populations, but as soon as you go outside the city limits or into, you know, 5K, <laughs> away from the, the exchange in the UK, everything falls apart. Uh, how do you get to a remote community? How do you get to someone who's in a, in a private environment, a private network, and that, that's moving? Um, and so I think what we're seeing, and I think where, where some of the, the parts of the industry will go on the CDN side are, um, you know, how do we best delegate requests when we know they should be served from a certain location? A lot of work's happened around those kind of things in, uh, for example, the SVA, um, the uh, CDNI initiatives, I guess, Mark, will be talked about in uh, in your own uh, CDN Alliance group as, as much as anything. I think, you know, somewhat to Thierry's point, you know, increase in density in highly populated areas or uh, access to uh, more flexible bandwidth or uh, flexible capacity or to be able to use that capacity in a flexible manner. So there's sort of things like that which are going to become critical. But then, you know, if we're just if we're deployed into discrete locations where there is local network capacity, but the upstream capacity is limited, or the backhaul is limited, or really expensive, um, and therefore can't be uh, easily expanded to serve uh, you know thousands of titles to anybody at, at all times, it's it's about deploying services like ours into those locations to amplify what's there, and I think that's kind of kind of interesting uh, as we think about the convergence of IP as well. You know, if we go to, you know, the DVB, DVBI specs or ATSC3, we're going to use a lot more IP. Um, it can be scaled for live, but how do we also protect the backhaul pieces so they're not just, you know, we're expecting them all to grow at the same rate. How do we, how do we smart, how do we be smart about how we use the infrastructure? Smart on distribution, basically. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's a good segue towards uh, towards Terry um, because I know he is always on the lookout on alternative ways of distribution. Let's put it that way. Um, because I mean everything is growing from traffic. You know this. Um, given the developments of whatever multicast, ABR, five G broadcasts, deep telco caching, etc. Where do you think the, the the market is going in terms of what kind of adoption? Uh, would be next. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for uh, for it, Mark. So I will go maybe in a, a bit uh, structured approach one by one. So with uh, different uh, topics like standard market, what we should watch and my personal take, of course, which is 
always a, a, a biased one since my employer employs me to have uh, opinions or fully aligned with what we do in my company. So let's look at multicast ABR. As you know, started uh, four or five years ago. Cable Lab started with it, DVB, and uh, my leadership decided to standardize it. I think it was good to have a standard or beyond what Cable Lab was doing. So in terms of market, we see few development. And obviously, you know that Broadpeak is leading the charge. And more recently, we saw Telecom Italia was decided uh, to deploy the technology, which is very good to have a big operator, probably half a million subs. But the critical content that needs to scale <laughs> comes from Dazon. And uh, Dazon, mm -hmm. as you know, is not using uh, Telecom Italia to distribute this content. So we still have not done what I call an acid test. And I think the next step should be to have a big content provider hosting his content on an ISP like Telecom Italia. And then I think we would see what's the benefit of multicast ABR, especially if we can do A-B comparison with or without. So that would be my, my personal take. Uh, on my personal uh, perspective on, on um, what's happening in multicast ABR world, uh, my take is this is really a temporary technology. You probably have all have heard the uh, infamous uh, panel with Tosh Telecom saying this is good, but it's not for the long term. They are all uh, thinking uh, in, inside DT at the full ABR scaling using uh, IP. Uh, but yeah, I, think, yeah. I, I think what is also interesting is that if you want to cache it in the ISP network, you probably need to have a much stronger infrastructure than the one currently available and uh, pushing pizza box, I do not believe is the way forward. So it also will be part of our conversation. Second uh, technology, which is now taking some wind is the 5G broadcast. So for those who do not know, 3GPP had multiple releases of coming from EMBMS to uh, multicast to more broadcast support in the 5G ecosystem. When I say ecosystem is the, the cell tower, the distribution to the device, and of course the device itself, as you know, 4G EMBMS was not a success, mostly because the device uh, support was poor, especially Apple. And now you see Apple sitting at 3GPP, which is always a, a good, um, a good sign. So in terms of market, you see the broadcaster, especially in Europe, pushing very hard and they have created this 5G mag uh, consortium uh, head uh, pushed by EBU. And the use case is really millions of fans watching popular sports event in the stadium or outside of the stadium. And I think this is a, a valid use case from my perspective. And I think if you look at um, the use case of the Olympics, the World Cup, or why not a very uh, popular uh, game of uh, football game like uh, Sunday uh, football or, Saturday or Thursday night football in the US. I, I think there will be a, a good use case for that. And my prediction, if we want to align the timing, the technology and the device availability, especially Apple, it's probably shooting at Paris 2024. Nothing to do with my citizenship, but I think it will be a good timing for that. Uh, I think stadium use case is valid one and of course very popular event like uh, the World Cup and the Olympics. But never forget, I always try to remember that golden number that 80% of the mobile usage is on the Wi-Fi network. So this mobile is not going to replace Wi-Fi, although in some cases we believe that uh, fixed wireless could be a replacement, but this is more a niche as opposed to a, a mainstream, as you know, fiber and the Doxys 3 are coming very, very strong now to consumer at very affordable prices. Last but not the least, the deep telco caching. As you know, we have the open caching initiative. We have also the open cut from the SVA. We have open connect from Netflix, who's basically uh, pushing to the throat of ISP its own caches. And we'll see if this if this works, especially in Korea. I know you have a question on the subject market. Mm -hmm. hot topic. Obviously, uh, in terms of market development, we have Quilt which is now leading the charge with several ISP announced. And I believe uh, you also will see uh, some uh, on net uh, cash uh, the whole way. So this is what uh, a lot of companies are doing, the CapEx model. I bring my caches in order to optimize your OTT traffic. But this is going to be transformed when we see the IPTV 2.0 happening, which is IPTV all unicast delivered to the ISP network. And this is something which is exactly aligned with the OTT traffic. It's the same protocol, it's the same mm -hmm. device, maybe not the same traffic, but it, I think there will be a convergence between the two. So don't think uh, OTT without thinking IPTV 2.0. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unmanaged, unmanaged delivery, managed network. Correct, right? yeah. on net, off net. 
And of course, you always have this dangling uh, topic of MEC for mobile network operators. But if mm -hmm. you look at the traffic, if you tell me IoT traffic is going to match uh, this uh, Netflix traffic, I think I will ask you to stop smoking. Either you are in Amsterdam or in California, where both are uh, available to consumers. <laughs> Please don't quote me on that. Uh, now let's look at what we should look at. Of course, open caching has to scale. It's not because you have one, two, three, or five ISP that you are going to cover the need of ODT provider. You need hundreds. And my company is in the business of the hundred as opposed to the ones. Second topic to watch is when are we going to see cloud infrastructure deployed at ISPs? Uh, so far, they were trying to buy data center, they pull back, they put uh, MEC with the hyperscaler, but they do realize the business case is not there. So there will be a lot of motion in the space of ISP touching cloud infrastructure. My personal take uh, beyond uh, open caching that is only a protocol spec, you need to look at the cloud infrastructure deployed at the ISP for wired network. Uh, knowing those guys, and uh, Mark, you come also from this uh, environment, this might take some time, and I want to say sometime it might be some years and not some months. That's all for the French jury. <laughs> Good. I'm going to move to Brenton, just a little remark. Uh, Thierry, if you can look at your audio, because it's relatively low. So if you can oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. I'm trying to fix that. Is that better now? Uh, not sure. Try, yeah. try, try to speak louder, maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe you need to speak up a little. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll move to Brendan. Brendan, um, Tashmir is all about monitoring, right? So, I mean, if you hear the story from Cherry uh, already and Steve as well, um, there's going to be all kinds of different technologies uh, fighting for uh, existence, basically, in the end. Um, that is a little monitoring nightmare, uh, I can imagine, um, yeah. especially especially in the live OTT workflows. Yeah. Um, how do you, what, what's the impact on your end in terms of monitoring all this? Because uh, it's getting more diverse, more complicated maybe even. So how do you ensure overall high QE yeah. metrics on, on end users in QS as part of it? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, thanks very much for the question. and and. Uh, I, I, I like what, the, what Terry and Steve have been saying. Uh, I'm particularly a big fan of the open caching thing because I think that's uh, going to be a, a big um, big influence and, and on-premise on cloud as well, or, or in the ISP cloud. Um, the, the problem is that it is very diverse. And, and then if you want to uh, make it a little bit more complicated, no two OTT providers put the same technology, well, technologies together the same way. So they'll use, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, we, I know a lot of uh, Terry's customers, we, we work on uh, similar customers and and no Voss uh, 360 um, implementation uses all the same components up and down downstream, you know? So every single implementation is, is actually unique. Uh, they, they may use common components, but they put them together in different ways for different reasons. Different markets have different things and people, people have come from different histories. So, as you say, it's very difficult to put together monitoring for that. Um, we did do, uh, I mean, all of us uh, here, here, all the um, all the panel are from the S on the SVA, and we're all very active members. And and one of the ones that I worked on was uh, basically the QOE uh, best practices for end-to-end -end monitoring. Uh, and really, what we we discussed in that paper was that actually you've got to monitor every point and every handoff between every point because they, those are the potential moments for problems. Uh, but the, you know, it's all very well to monitor all of those things, but you then need to pull it all together, uh, mm -hmm. and give it and, and put that data together in a in a correlated way, so that when a problem occurs, you know, you you can quickly identify the root cause. And yeah, of course, that's what we do. Um, but it, but it's essential. And 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 we you know we help other people do bits of it themselves in their own way. People have got um, lots of interesting log analytics tools and things like that that actually lend it to it. But but the the, the Big problem we see that, that needs to be continually solved is that you've got lots of data and lots of errors. When, when a problem occurs, errors come from everywhere. And, you know, uh, not that anything would ever come from encoder. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip the encoder, but, you know, you, you might get a bad signal, have a bad signal acquisition. It's dead, right? That's going to cause errors all the way through the delivery chain. So you, everything is going to be going red, 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 blah, 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 blah. And, and these 24 7 knock, knock operations just have flooded with problems. They don't know where, what's the root cause. 
And that's why we try to put things together in a, in a um, sort of simple visual way that identifies that root cause. And, and, that, and that's really the, the key to what we do. And it, as I say, we've built a, a way of doing it in a pretty simple way um, and, and basically allowing you to put the components together in whichever way you need to put them together. And that's what we continue to, uh, to, to do. It's a, a never ending piece of work, but we, uh, mm -hmm. we keep going and keep trying. And, you know, we, we help people as much as we can and, and identify the, the core areas that they need to focus on. Um, but but it's, a, it's a, you know, continual work in progress and it will continue to change. If anyone thinks that, um, you know, next year OTT will be done, <laughs> they're, they're completely wrong. It's going to continue to evolve. Uh, and uh, so you have to have a way of being able to continually improve that. Um, and that's what we're trying to help people do. Uh, and with the collaboration of all of our wonderful other members at SVA, we, we try to work on standard, pretty, you know, building block ways of, of approaching that problem. Cool. Cool. Um, Steve, a little bit um, in the air, let's put it that way, in the cloud, I want to call it. Um, low, earth, uh, low earth orbit satellites. Um, I mean, those are slowly spreading um, and, and over time it's expected that um, these will be an enabler for more internet access, more usage. Um, do you think this will actually help more edge compute, more edge capabilities um, on earth in the end, right? Or will they eventually some sort of compete uh, by calling it whatever, edge in the air or how you want to call it? Um, and compete with things like um, MBMS or for the involved MBMS uh, hmm. in that area? I, I think you know, the way to look at this question is not necessarily about the LEOs themselves, right? The low Earth orbit satellites themselves and, and the, the capacity they're delivering, but thinking about, again, Howdy. what we're designing for, right? Or the, the, the different discrete set of technologies for, for different use cases. So. You know, we're doing some work, for example, in in private five G networks. Um, and as Thierry said, you know, the the use case for uh, what you might call leisure activities, sport activities, at this time is relatively clear in an environment where um, there's either a desire to produce discrete content for that location, or for the audience to be spread across a multitude of locations, or it's in a big area. Um, and there are a number of projects in the in the space to look at that. The, the interesting thing is you can create the connectivity for it. You know, um, FE MBMS is likely in a, certainly in a private environment to offer the capability to deliver a live stream for everybody if there's enough airspace where you are and not too much concrete. But at the point where um, you're thinking about how do people consume content and you think about the actual way in which people interact with content, if I wanted to see that piece of action again, I immediately want to live rewind. Right. Or I walk behind the piece of concrete, I lose my packet. And can I drop on to uh, the, the locally cached content? So in addition to the connectivity, there is a need to get the content there, too, and have it locally available okay. so that, you know, I can be five seconds out from uh, you know, the guy two seats in front of me. Or I can go to the bathroom when I come back, I can pick up where I left off if I can't see the action or I can join into the streams from the different part of, you know, whatever the uh, Thierry's point uh, 2024 events what's happening in the other places and can i watch that uh you know that high jump again and so i think the challenge is the the connectivity may be coming and then the challenge is can we also put the content in the right place um so that we can overcome the cost challenge of going back over the back or we can we can amplify that nature of the connectivity and if you're using you know connectivity in um uh, satellites for I don't know in in air for example it, it's is it still relatively expensive and are we going to consume all the upstream bandwidth because everyone's watching something different everyone w walks onto an airplane with their own set of subscriptions and if you're enabling them to watch some of those um, you're going to overwhelm the upstream connectivity anyway relatively quickly and so it becomes a very expensive way <laughs> to allow people to consume content um, and so make the content available when needed and work out how to achieve that uh, and putting the cache in the right place will continue to be a problem. So maybe for MEC, if you can deploy cache into MEC and make it useful from a file system perspective, have I got cache there or not? That's an interesting part of it versus, yeah, I spun up an instance, but I've got nothing in cache. Is it useful? Uh, might be for a live stream, uh, might not be, uh, depending on how many people are there. So, you know, 
I think the use case has to continue to be considered. Yes, the connectivity can come. Um, what do we, how do we put content in the right place? I think will continue to be the challenge. Yeah, no. okay, but you really more see it as an enabler rather than a... I think so. I think it enables it enables people in places who don't have connectivity today to have connectivity. How do you best make use of it so it's affordable and effective uh, and you get quality across the content you're distributing? That's still the key challenge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thierry, um, I mean, I know it's a hot topic for you, Netflix and SK Telecom, SK Broadband. Um, uh, and they, they, they had a public fallout basically saying, hey, uh, Netflix, you need to pay for the delivery. Uh, the costs are getting too high. Um, is this uh, uh, a potential future standoff between ISPs and kind of providers again? Um, and do you think this will drive more innovation? Because people are now getting a little bit afraid, like, hey, is this like in a, in a country like South Korea, which is known for being extremely well connected, uh, that exactly there this is happening. Uh, do you think this is uh, causing more issues in the end, or will this drive more innovation? Yeah. So first, I would like to say that the situation is de very different country by country. And even in Europe, where you might think there is a European regulation, each country decides the way they want to deal with net neutrality. As you know, Germany has, for example, uh, prevented uh, 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 zero yeah. rating as opposed to US and then some other countries in Europe are saying, yes, it could be used, but only in this condition. So it's very country specific. So what happened in Korea, for those who didn't read the press, so Netflix is flooding the network work and ISP are asking Netflix to pay. So this is not a stupid conversation. It's actually a very relevant conversation. And if you recall, Open Connect was basically a CDN bill by Netflix where Netflix brings its own caches in the ISP network and the ISP network just hosts the, the server without doing anything to it. Now in Korea, it happens that the ISP are asking money. It's this kind of ransom type of discussion. You sit on my network, but if you don't bring, so we, we believe that the open connect caches are not uh, installed at SKT because SKT is asking for money for that. So now SKT sees the traffic and then asking for even more money than initially if they had to accept the open connect caches. My take is that this will be a conversation that will, I think will not stop here. So mm -hmm. ISP might uh, request money, the Korean style, but ISP might be smarter and say, hey, Mr. Content Provider, why don't we build together a solution where I don't have to give you money, but or you don't have to give me money, but I might be paid per traffic I'm caching. And back to my previous conversation where the ISP could be involved in the technology and business equation of caching, such as uh, open caching, but also maybe other application like acceleration of application. So we believe this will be a very hot topic in the coming years. If you ask me what is my crystal ball and who is going to win, I would say think about the open connect infrastructure of Netflix. And if an ISP had basically the guts to go to Netflix and say, I have a standard based solution, Mr. Netflix, why don't you use my solution instead of using your own caches and therefore charging Netflix for that? Okay, good, good, Crystal Ball. Uh, Brendan, last question. Um, you, um, uh, you, um, you're known for doing very large events, or very, very uh, large live events, streaming, and monitoring those. Um, so what if you if you look at the last years, basically? Uh, what are the common challenges or typical issues, let's say, occur in the delivery chain? Is that really on the edge edge, so between you know, the last mile? Is this earlier in, 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 in the connection area between, between uh, CDN and ISP? Or where do you typically see those issues? And where do you think what innovation would be needed to go beyond that? To um, well, yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> The, we do a lot of them. The, I would. I, I don't think I could really say that there's a lot of common issues. I mean, I think nearly every event is, is has different issues, and, and I think um, the good thing is that uh, everyone's building a lot of redundancy in now. So, so um, very few viewers are impacted. But you know, i just remember I was in the war room for, for the last uh, big football game in in the US, and 
And, uh, you know, a big issue happened. It lasted 30 minutes, but there was zero viewer impact because um, it was there was redundancy and all the monitor, all the redundancy was monitored. Um, and, and you know, really it takes a team of people to, to actually do that and to be on top of it. And uh, some, a, a funny thing that I was talking to someone about it recently that people don't realize is like, oh yeah, you know, we've got all this traffic on this CDN and there's a problem in this area. We need to move that traffic onto a different CDN. Well, that doesn't happen just like that. It actually is quite a task to actually move that traffic uh, and takes a lot of coordination, a lot of people to do it. Um, so I, th I think you just see you just see lots of different problems happen all the time. But I, I would I would say where it needs to go is is oh, basically what Terry's talking about is, is this is a standard that gets the caches more into the ISPs because the closer you get that content to the to the end users, the better. And the CDNs are great, but it's it's it, they're, they're dispersed all over the place, and and it's still not good enough for some of the these big events. And if you could have more along the lines of what Disney does, uh, which is using a uh, very standards-based uh, approach to, to the majority of their traffic. And they also have very multi-CDN as well, but they're, they're, they've got a lot of their traffic on CDN nodes that they control uh, using open standards. I think that's definitely where, where things have got to go. Um, yeah, that, that's my, my take on it. So more openness, more collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And closer to, closer to the consumers. Um, most of the consumer and delivery. Yeah, yeah. Maybe okay. less battlefield, um, bat battles. And more, more, yeah. And more, more collaboration where engineers sit next to each other as opposed yeah. to sending letters through, I would say, uh, through journalists. And it, yes. I mean, it's, price, it's not, price, we never solve price. problem like this. We know that. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, you know, just to take that point just a tiny bit further, is that, you know, building these standards-based thing, you know, like it lets people deliver fantastic content, everyone deliver, because this isn't the where they should be competing. It's the wrong place to compete. They need to com the, 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 they need to compete on their apps, on, on, the, on the, you know, how they, they interact with their fans and things like that. Not on this delivery side of it. It's, it's silly to, to compete there. It's not, you know... Uh, it, it, they should go, get more into delivering better real user experience, which is when you're watching a sporting event, all the different camera angles you can you can show, and all you know fun stuff like that that people really uh, um, want to yeah, see. Yeah. Okay. So guys, I'm gonna I'm right over time a little bit. I'm gonna hand it over back to Dom. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, for your time. And uh, I hope, I'm not sure if you're all there, but hope to see you at IBC. Perfect. Let's have a proper goodbye from everyone. There's Brenton. Give us a wave, Brenton. Thanks always, very much. Great to be here. Always a pleasure to see you, sir. And you, Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. And uh, Steve, there you go. Give us a thumbs up and a wave. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Nice Brilliant. to see you all. And uh, Mark, we'll see you again shortly for, uh, for I can't remember which session you've got coming next, but you've got a couple more later on today. So uh, we will see you in a bit.